GE and Alco, two companies one could say were as different as they were alike. While the two companies would initially collaborate on early diesel locomotive production, this would eventually come to a very abrupt end due to quality control problems on both ends of the partnership and or mutual agreement the two companies had reached to produce diesel locomotives. As mentioned before, these two companies were quite different. Alco was an amalgamation of several smaller locomotive companies. These companies included the Brooks Locomotive Works in Dunkirk, New York, the Cookie Locomotive and Machine Works in Patterson, New York, the Dickinson Manufacturing Company in Scranton, Pennsylvania, the Manchester Locomotive Works in Manchester, New Haven, the Pittsburgh Locomotive and Car Works in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the Rhode Island Locomotive Works in Providence, Rhode Island, the Schenectady Locomotive Works based in Schenectady, New York, and the Richmond Locomotive Works in Richmond, Virginia. With the completion of this merger, locomotive production would be consolidated at Schenectady, New York. In 1904, the American Locomotive Works, or ALCO as it would begin to be known, especially as it got into diesel locomotive production, would add another feather in its cap with the acquisition of the uh, Locomotive and Machinery Company of Montreal, aka the Montreal Locomotive Works, in 1904. This would prove an extremely wise move for Alco, especially in later years, as it would allow the company to develop a very successful export locomotive business, which would not be subject to U.S. taxes and or export bans. It would also give Alco access to the domestic Canadian market, which due to increasing regulations put on by the Canadian government, making importing locomotives very unfavorable for railroads, would give Alco direct access to this market. One year later in 1905, Alco would make one more major acquisition in terms of locomotive manufacturing companies in the form of the Rogers Locomotive Works, based in Patterson, New Jersey. Little known today, at the time it was the second largest locomotive manufacturing company in the United States, directly behind Baldwin. Alco would also briefly get into electric locomotive manufacturing, as it would briefly manufacture a line of 60-ton center cab electric freight locomotives for some inner urban lines in Oregon. In 1929, the company would make yet another acquisition with the purchase of Macintosh & Seymour, a diesel prime mover manufacturing company based in Auburn, New York, that would essentially be brought on board as Alco's in-house diesel prime mover producer, the company having entered the diesel locomotive production market in 1924 with a partnership between itself and GE, more on this later, and the production of a box cab type diesel locomotive referred to as the 60 tonner. Although it should be noted that this particular locomotive had its prime mover produced by Insel Rand, not Macintosh and Seymour. Alco was essentially centered around locomotive production and at one point automobile production and of course tank production during the war and even did steel production for major projects for other companies as a side business to its main businesses. The amalgamation of several smaller companies being put together to form one larger one has a tendency to put stress on the employees involved in these said companies. In short, it's statistically impossible for everyone to get along with everybody else. You're bound to run into some kind of conflict, especially when this many small companies are put together. This plus extreme mismanagement resulted in chronic labor relations issues within the company, which in turn led to chronic strikes. One that took place in the late 60s most notable, as this would finally take the company down. In sharp contrast to the narrowly focused Alco, General Electric was a very much more diversified company. The company was founded way back in the late 1800s by none other than the famous Thomas Edison, and would begin to heavily diversify itself, especially as the 1900s moved on. Moving from everything from TV and radio, thanks to its acquisition of the former Marconi Company in 1919, which would eventually become RCA, not to mention several TV and radio stations the company would have put together and essentially spin off later on and in some cases reacquire to consumer electronics and appliances outside of TV sets and basically pretty much anything that had to do with consumerism during this period in time in post-war early to mid-50s America. It should also be noted that the company pre the deal with Alco to produce diesel electric locomotives produced electric locomotives. Locomotives such as the NYC T1, released as the S1 later in its life. These engines were ordered by the New York Central to traverse the massive and now electrified Park Avenue Tunnel, which needed to be electrified due to a severe accident that occurred on January 8, 1902. This at that time was the biggest railway accident to take place in New York City and would result in a new New York City ordinance that would quickly be passed, demanding that all trains operating into New York City had to be, and I quote, 
smokeless, meaning they could not be propelled by any method that would require any kind of exhaust at all if they were hauling passengers, and thus utilizing the subterranean railway network that led into New York City. The only option for railroads for propulsion of these trains, therefore, was electricity, and the before mentioned electrification of the Park Avenue Tunnel, as well as the newly built Grand Central Station having a fully electrified train shed entrance area and platform area. This and the later S2 series of locomotives, as well as the S3 series of locomotives which superseded the S2, collecting their power from a third rail laid inside the tunnel. In addition to the third rail powered locomotives, the company would also produce catenary propelled locomotives, most notably for the New Haven Railroad, models such as the EP3, which was utilized for both passenger freight on the New Haven, New York, and Hartford Railroad, to one of its most notable creations, the GG1 Electric, which was built for the Pennsylvania Railroad for use between New York City and Washington, D.C. on the Pennsylvania Railroad's northeast corridor. These engines were for the longest time considered the speed demons of that particular line, able to reach speeds in excess of 100 miles per hour. Their design was so far ahead of its time that even GE struggled to make a replacement for them, with its Model E60 failing to live up to Amtrak's expectations and eventually being degraded to secondary use before being retired altogether due to issues with high-speed operations. This actually resulted in the GG1s being rebuilt by Amtrak and having their top speeds increased to 110 miles per hour, resulting in at least some of these units having service lives in excess of 50 years, with the last ones being being retired in the early 1980s. In short and in sharp contrast to Alco at that time, GE could be considered like a giant octopus, wrapping its tentacles around every business it saw fit, with a seemingly endless amount of capital to back up all these acquisitions and or new ventures. The partnership between Alco and GE to manufacture diesel locomotives, which was initiated in 1924, proved very advantageous specifically for GE. All it had to do was supply the electrical components while Alco took care of the actual body design of the locomotive itself, as well as the prime mover, which in this case was subcontracted out to the Insole Corporation. The original model was known as the 60 ton because it weighed 60 tons and was superseded by the 100 ton as it weighed 100 tons. Like any brand new piece of technology, these locomotives had a bit of a checkered reputation from the start. But it's hard to criticize Alco, at least at this point, as there were actually no other locomotives in production to compare them with, although GM would later start production of its own diesel line of locomotives to compete with Alco. With the acquisition of EMC Corporation, which GM would rename EMD Division. These locomotives were produced almost exclusively for the Central New Jersey Railroad, who were under extreme pressure to get rid of the steam engines in the city limits of New York as well as New Jersey. Both of these locomotives, due to the way they looked, as well as the 66-ton model that came out in 1931, belonged to a class of locomotives referred to as box cabs, as they largely were box cars that were self-propelled. Alco's first step away from the original box cab design came in 1928 with the introduction of the New York Central Unit number 1525. There is no official classification for this one-off locomotive, but it is notable for its unusual design compared to the former box cabs, as well as the fact that it was the first locomotive to debut with a Macintosh and Seymour power plant. Again, Alco would then acquire this company in 1929 to be its in-house diesel prime mover manufacturer. The company would continue to expand its line of diesel locomotives with the production of the Alco 300, the first designed specifically around the Macintosh and Seymour more prime movers. Incidentally, this diesel switcher was known as the 300 because its prime mover produced 300 horsepower. The model was followed by a series that was unofficially known as the HH series. This class of locomotives would debut in 1931 with the HH 600, named for the fact that, well, you guessed it again, it made 600 horsepower. As one can probably guess, HH is short for high hood. This incidentally was not an official name given to the locomotive by Alco, but rather a designation given to it by rail fans due to its high hood. The rail fan designation HH is then followed by the horsepower rating of the prime mover to differentiate one locomotive model from the other. While these locomotives were essentially very conventionally and very basically designed with the now Alco owned Macintosh and Seymour Corporation developed 538 prime mover sitting atop a flat surface hence the high hood, and thus limiting visibility, they still had some innovations. The 538 Prime Mover, for example, was one of the first equipped with a turbocharger, known as the 538T, which in addition to its more efficient four-cycle combustion system, and sharp contrast to EMD's two-cycle combustion, allowing it to reach a whopping 1,000 horsepower, unheard of for the time for a prime mover of only six cylinders. With ever-increasing competition coming from GM and their recently acquired EMC division, which was now known as the EMD division, 
Alco introduced its new S series of switchers, starting with the S1 in 1940. The S series of switchers were unique as they were the first locomotive developed by Alco that featured the prime mover set up to sit between the frame rails and therefore lower down rather than sitting on top of the frame rails as in previous Alco designs. This was achieved by designing the 539 prime mover specifically for the S series frame rails and to sit between them instead of on top of them. This allowed the hood to be lowered and thus give the crew better visibility for switching tasks. Much like AMD's products at the time, such as the NW series, the S1 was also the debut for the new 539 Prime Mover, which would go on to power thousands of Alco locomotives. Most notably, the 539T variant that made an even 1,000 horsepower, again squeezed from just six cylinders. It should be noted by this point that Alco still didn't regard the diesel locomotive market as being anything more than a fad, much like its competitors such as Baldwin and Lima. However, it became very clear at this point with the success it was having with its switchers that this was the way forward, and Alco would make a wise decision to move further into diesel locomotive production, something it had been very apprehensive and hesitant to do. By the late 1930s, Alco began to realize there was a market for diesel road locomotives, having seen the success that its competitor EMD had had with its E and F T series of locomotives. Utilizing a modified auto cooler design, the company would develop what it called the DL109, which was actually the final name that came for the series, which stretched all the way back to the DL-103, produced in 1939. This would be one of Alco's first mistakes as it rushed to get the engine into production using existing technology which would be adapted instead of starting with a brand new sheet of paper for the prime mover, although everything else, including the frame, was new from the ground up. To get around the problem with the lack of horsepower output from its prime movers, the most powerful of which could only make a thousand horsepower, Alco would simply install two prime movers in this locomotive. This would create an issue later on. Although to be fair, EMD did the same thing with its E units, doubling up two 567s to get horsepower output ratings to the levels they wanted. Problems with the electronics put in by GE, as well as the prime movers, the 538 and 39 that were utilized in these locomotives, which turned out to not really be cut out for road use, plus the fact that vibrations generated by these prime movers would harmonize, as again, each of these locomotives had two of them, causing the locomotive to shake violently, even when idling at a station, would spell disaster for this model. While these engines did have exceptionally long lives, surviving until the 1950s, and in some cases 16s for some companies, the fact of the matter was this locomotive was one of Alco's first flops. Due to the before mentioned reliability issues and the fact that even with the booster units added in, the total still came to less than 80 units built and would be the last time Alco ever referred to a locomotive by the DL designation. But unfortunately, this would not be Alco's last big mistake or flop. The DL from this point on would simply be used to distinguish models in its catalog, but would never be used as an official model name. While World War I was just around the corner, Alco would make another release that would turn out to be a revolution in the form of the RS-1. In 1941, the world's first road switcher. Built on an S-series locomotive frame from its S-series of switchers, and extended long enough to allow for a small hood in front of the cab to be utilized for the installation of a steam generator for passenger service and or commuter service, as well as to allow it to accommodate road trucks. This locomotive was the first type locomotive built in North America that could do switch jobs, locals, as well as mainline freights and passenger service, all put together in one very flexible package. Adding to the flexibility of these locomotives, Alco made them very easy to MU or put together in teams, allowing a few of these smaller engines to handle one big job together, allowing for even more flexibility for a company that were to purchase, say, a fleet of them. Unfortunately, with the start of World War II, all the locomotives that Alco managed to produce before the war were drafted, if you will, into the army, and were sent overseas to serve on the Trans-Iranian Railway. Few of these locomotives would ever return to the United States, but that didn't stop Alco from ramping up production after World War II, when the engine was finally able to prove its worth. While depending upon who you talk to, this locomotive couldn't quite be considered a work of art. However, the locomotive's well-rounded capabilities essentially being a drag of all trades more than made up for this. Alco wasn't going to stand still, however, and they had planned to release a secret weapon that would increase the horsepower output of this locomotive and be featured in several of its newer locomotives post-war. That weapon was known as the infamous 244 Prime Mover. On paper, the 244 seemed to be the perfect product for the time for Alco. In sharp contrast to the 539's limited 6-cylinder capacity, this Prime Mover could accept up to 16 cylinders. 
and in its 16-cylinder form would make 2,000 horsepower initially, but eventually be upgraded to 2,250 horsepower. This particular version of the 244 would be featured in Alco's bigger six-axle variant locomotives, such as the Alco PA. Unfortunately, Alco would begin to make the same mistake a lot of its competitors made with their diesel locomotive production, essentially treating diesel locomotives like steam engines that were propelled by diesel engines. This meant that the company didn't seem to understand how much precision was involved in making a reliable and robust diesel prime mover for its locomotives. As in the past, Macintosh and Seymour had simply built their own prime movers to Alco's specifications, with Macintosh and Seymour utilizing the knowledge it had built up in producing diesel locomotive engines to extensively and carefully troubleshoot them for any major problems. Now, of course, with Alco taking a more direct hand in diesel engine production for its diesel locomotives, it didn't understand what went into them and therefore pushed them out much more aggressively, not understanding what the consequences would be. Alco was also under the gun at this point, as fellow competitor Fairbanks Morris had already started its post-war locomotive production in the form of the Fairbanks Morris Erie built, which was actually built of all places and ironically enough at GE's Erie plant, hence its name. Well, it is certainly understandable why Alco wanted to get these new prime movers out as quickly as possible to beat GM, who were in the process of retooling, as well as its other competitors to market. The fact of the matter was, cutting corners on this prime mover would prove to be a disastrous move. Not to mention the fact that the quality testing for the 244 prototypes would be very much limited. Whatever the case, Alco introduced the new 244 prime mover in its model Alco FA in 1946, designed to be a freight road locomotive, and then in its much more glamorous system or the Alco PA. Later that same year, this prime mover would also debut in the RS2 and eventually the RS3. And this, unfortunately, is where the lack of precision in terms of testing the prime mover and developing it came into play. Many early adopter railroads that bought these particular locomotives with the new 244s would discover after they had some mileage on them that they were prone to trouble, mainly broken crankshafts, blown turbos, as well as cracked blocks, the latter being a symptom of Alco trying to push these prime movers out any way they could from Macintosh and Seymour's plant. With several disturbing tactics, including the wages that the employees were paid based upon the total prime movers produced, utilized to push these prime movers out as fast as possible. The end result, these prime movers were pushed out in such rapid succession that many were delivered with cracked blocks, or improperly seated main bearings and other such flaws as well as shoddy welding. This situation further aggravated Alco's lack of quality testing on the prime mover, leading to a very massive disaster. While Alco did offer a warranty on these locomotives, we have to remember, again, as I've said a million times, railroads simply can't cancel half their trains on a whim's notice just because the locomotives aren't working. They have to find alternative methods of getting their cargo and or passengers to where they need to go. If not, the companies won't actually make money. As the old saying states, if a shark doesn't swim, it dies. And so while these locomotives with their defective prime movers were sent back to Alco and or were repaired in the field by Alco technicians and or attempted to be so, the railroads had to find additional locomotives to repel these trains. Mainly this came in the guise of EMD products such as the GP7 and 9 and passenger cab units such as the EMD E and F units. While many railroads would demo and or lease these locomotives temporarily, many railroads would discover that the then EMD products of the time were superior in terms of their reliability to the Alco products, at least in terms of long term. It should also be noted that GE wasn't blameless here, as it offered Alco its RD series of water-cooled turbochargers to help improve the 244's reliability. Unfortunately, these turbochargers proved even less reliable than what Alco was making at the time, causing even more problems for the company. It would take until the 510 and 710 turbos were introduced by Alco for the mess to finally be cleared up in the mid-1950s, which also coincided with the 244H prime mover being introduced, which corrected most of the flaws with the 244 once and for all. Unfortunately, this final and much-needed revision to the 244 prime mover came far too late to save Alco's reputation and failed to save the company from a drastic market share loss, which would get worse as the development of its next prime mover would drag on. By this point, toward the mid-50s, GE had had enough and decided it was branching out on its own, and essentially dissolved its partnership with Alco. The company had already started producing its export line of locomotives under the U-Series banner, or Universal Series of Locomotives. Now, one would have thought that GE would have learned from its partner's mistakes by this point. Unfortunately, this was not the case. Models such as the UD-18B, which relied on a prime mover produced by Cooper Bezimer, had major issues with their prime movers and electronics. Due to these issues, less than a thousand total of these early 
Daily Production Universal Series export locomotives were sold. GE, however, was not giving up. They were developing their own internal power plant to propel these locomotives, known as the FDL-16 Prime Mover. Now, one would think with all the massive cash reserves GE had that this would not have been a big deal to design. Unfortunately, FDL-16 would be a troublesome engine right from the start. One of its most notable issues pre-production was a massive leak between the head and the block. After spending millions upon millions of dollars in trying to rectify the situation internally, and remember, this was a 1950s cast, so add inflation to all of that. GE handed the prime mover, which was still dysfunctional at this point, over to a Swiss lab and told them to cure it. By this point, the one Achilles heel that GE had began to cause its issues, and that it was the fact that it had investors who were not happy with the limited returns the locomotive production division was making. Under pressure from its shareholders, the board had ordered the diesel locomotive production division rolled up. This is to say, of course, shut down in the mid-1950s. An ironic and somewhat ridiculous twist, the company would be saved by a goof made by Alco, its former partner turned competitor, who at this point, after long delays in ensuring that the new Prime Mover was up to the task, in 1956, finally released its new 251 Prime Mover, which was proving to be very robust and reliable. It's equally very robust and reliable Alco RS-11, essentially the direct successor to the RS-2 and 3, making a whopping 1800 horsepower, outperforming EMD's then current current model of the GP9 by 50 horsepower, and again doing this with 30% less fuel consumption thanks to 4 cycle combustion and turbocharging. Unfortunately, the company had suffered for its delays and had lost a lot of its market share, well at least with the domestic market. On the other hand, the 251 was making major inroads in Alco's ever expanding export business. That's why it came as an extreme shock when the company refused to produce a very specific engine for the South African Railways, which would eventually be known as the Class 30. 32,000, specifically due to the truck and or wheel arrangement the locomotive had. When Alco refused to build this locomotive to the South African Railway's specifications, GE, who had also bid on this project in tandem with Alco, had received word that it in fact had won the contract to produce the locomotive, in spite of the fact that the bid it gave was far less competitive than Alco's. This is a critical save for GE, as the company had already started rolling up its locomotive production division, and having this cash and or the order coming in for the these particular locomotives essentially put everything back on track, if you will. And thus, the South African Railway's 32,000 was put into production, and the company now gained an export locomotive contact, as due to the fact that the South African Railways were so highly satisfied with their GE-built class 32,000s, 60% of their future locomotives would actually come from GE, that would in turn help finance its domestic road locomotive called the U-Series, as well as the completion of development on the FDL-16. This was to culminate in the Model U-25B in April of 1959. Now, while it is true that these locomotives were flawed in terms of turbochargers and in terms of extremely poor quality steel that was utilized in producing them, they would in fact allow GE to gain a foothold in the domestic road switcher locomotive market, allowing the company to steal the number two spot from Alco. And while again these locomotives were subject to bad turbochargers, terrible steel that essentially caused the locomotives to dissolve like an Alka-Seltzer if they were exposed to too much rain, as well as various electrical problems caused by the modern transistorized electronics utilized in these locomotives. GE had this covered as it had its own internal propaganda department. <coughs> sorry, <coughs> sorry, customer relations department, which would ensure customers were properly paid off. <coughs> I'm sorry, <coughs> sorry, I keep doing that. My cold is still affecting me. Properly satisfied if they ran into a major issue with one of GE's products. GE did this by offering excellent trade-ins on Alco locomotives and other such engines, and at the same time offering the very best customer service it could. Not to mention very comprehensive warranty packages. It also allowed railroads both far and domestic, purchasing GE products actually financed their locomotives. This allowed the, by this point, ever more financially troubled U.S. railroads to acquire locomotives even if they could just barely keep the lights on. Again, this came back to GE's massive ample bankroll, basically financing this old division. Something, again, that Alco did not have. While the company did successfully take the number two spot from Alco, it was still a very, no, extremely distant number two behind GM's EMD division. With the total combined production of all of GE's U-boat models, failing to match the total sales of, of one of EMD's less successful models, specifically the GP30, which barely managed to sell 948 units. GE, however, was not giving up. Unfortunately for Alco, it had no choice but to close its doors at this point, 
ravaged by consistent strikes by its workforce, issues with corners being cut on new production locomotives such as steel cables being utilized instead of copper cables, to save a few bucks here and there at the expense of long-term and or even short-term reliability for these locomotives, engine piston caps being manufactured from inferior alloys, not to mention biblical build quality issues such as when one of the 6 Series Century units on test to a railroad suffered a major failure with its traction motors resulting in that company deciding not to actually pursue an order with Alco. All of this resulted in an even lower market share for Alco, which eventually would lead to the company going over the falls, the final straw being a strike that occurred in 1968, which in turn led Alco to leave the locomotive business that year. With Alco's Canadian partner, now turned successor, Montreal Locomotive Works, buying out its design firm and eventually resuming production of 251 base locomotives, this time under Canadian designs such as the M420, which would enter production in 1973. With the relatively successful M420 and M424s, plus several export models going to Mexico at that time, Montreal Locomotive Works seemed to be on a secure path. Unfortunately, this would begin to change just a few years later, with Canadian manufacturer turned railcar producer Bombardier purchasing a 59% stake in the company that was formerly held by the Worthington Corporation, who had actually bought out Alco in 1964. The company would then be eventually taken over in its entirety by Bombardier, producing the very highly ironically named HR series, short for high reliability. These locomotives proved anything but, as they failed to even outlast the locomotives they were intended to replace. The end result, after the cancellation of a major purchase of further engines by CN, Bombardier was driven into bankruptcy and was promptly bailed out by the Canadian government in 1985. In the same year, the company decided to divest itself of its locomotive manufacturing business, which would eventually be acquired by Canadian General Electric. In a very ironic twist, this particular plant, the former Montreal Locomotive Works plant, would actually start rebuilding many of the Dew Series locomotives that had essentially been instrumental in taking Alco out of business into what were called Super 7 Series locomotives. This operation would continue from 88 to 93 when the plant was finally closed by GE. Part of the plant was demolished in 2004 with the rest suffering arson fires before finally being leveled to the ground. Essentially, there is nothing left of the old Montreal Locomotive Works plant except a vacant lot. While this is the end of the Alco side of the story, it is not the end of GE. Far from it. GE would continue to gain momentum with its new Dash 7 and eventually its Dash 8 series that would eventually put GM in a very awkward position as not being number one anymore in the North American locomotive manufacturing industry. But that's another story. And with that, we've reached the end of this story. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. If not, thumbs down. Please subscribe and comment. And as always, keep the metal side down.